Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Whenever you are watching this, I am so glad to be with you. My name is Jenny Perez, for those of you I haven't had the privilege of meeting, and I am just so grateful for technology. What weird times we're living in right now. But what a blessing that we can still come together and learn about what God has to teach us through all of these amazing women in the Bible. I'm so grateful to be in somewhat fellowship with you right now. The women that I am so excited to bring to you today are Mary and Martha. Some of us have heard of them. Some of us are like, who are they? So Mary and Martha are two sisters, and they have at least one brother named Lazarus. They lived in a small country town called Bethany, which was about two miles from Jerusalem and a little bit south of the Mount of Olives. Jesus loved this family. He had an intimate relationship with them. I heard a quote the other day that a relationship is two-way. It's two entities or two people giving and receiving to one another. A ministry, on the other hand, is one way. It's one entity giving to another, not receiving anything in return. And we can see that Jesus had lots of ministry opportunities throughout his time on earth. But that was not the case with Mary, with Mary and Martha. He had a relationship with them where he was giving to them and receiving from them. Now, these women are very well known in Christian culture, so well known that a company has been named after them, Mary and Martha, and they have beautiful things for your home, as well as a multitude of books. Just a quick Amazon search will bring up titles like Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World, Having a Martha Home the Merry Way, Merry Morning, Martha Day, and Made Like Martha, Good news for women who get things done. That last one really gets me. <laughs> I can definitely relate to Martha. I'm a doer. I'm a shaker. I take action. I have a really hard time just sitting and being still, which is a struggle for me teaching right now. <laughs> but that last one really shows us how Martha is viewed in our culture, that we should be more like Mary, less like Martha. So before we get started, we're going to pray. We're going to pray that the chip on my shoulder for Martha is gone. We're going to pray that God would defend where he intends to defend and that where we can be softened where he wants us to soften. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for Mary and Martha and your intentions for them and bringing them into the scripture we thank you that even today we can read about them and um, we can see what you have for us to learn from them. We pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would open our eyes and our ears, that, Lord, anything that is of you would reach to these women's hearts and anything that is not of you would just fall flat to the ground. We pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, I want to look at three places where we see Mary and Martha in particular. The first place is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Just a recap of the situation. This is kind of the typical, if someone's going to say Mary and Martha, this is what most people are going to think. It's the Mary and Martha story, where we see that Jesus comes to Martha's home, and he's welcomed in, and Martha is busy. She's getting everything ready, food prepared, refills done, making sure everyone is comfortable. And we see Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha is not okay with this. And she comes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, can you not see my sister? She's just sitting there. Make her come and help me. Which, wow, that's pretty bold that someone would come to Jesus and tell him what to do. And Jesus, without hesitation, without shame, without condemnation, he just says, Martha, Martha, you are troubled and bothered by many things. But Mary, she has chosen the good portion, and it won't be taken from her. There's no shame. There's no condemnation in his defense of Mary, just a refocusing of Martha. So what do we see about these women in this story? We see, one, that Jesus has gone to Martha's home. That's incredible in those days. 
Nowadays, it seems like no big deal. I'm gonna go to Robin's house. I'm gonna go to Samantha's house. I'm gonna go to Veronica's house. It's not anything surprising that we would claim the woman's name we're going to see. But when you say in the Bible times, Martha's home, it indicates that Martha is the head of the household. This could indicate that she's a widow. It could indicate something entirely different. We're not exactly sure, but it is something to take note of. Also, she is fearless. She and her sister are welcoming a man who is being chased out of towns. He has death threats made to him. He is a total rebel as far as the Jewish population sees, and yet they're welcoming him into their home, making him comfortable. We also see that she's a good steward of her resources. Not only is she able to welcome Jesus, one person, she is able to welcome all of his disciples and probably quite a few people from town as well and still accommodate them to make them feel welcomed in her home. And she has such respect for the Lord. Her desire to serve him, to make him comfortable, to make this gathering something wonderful where he can focus on his teaching without having to worry about earthly needs is very clear. Then she gets a little bit stuck. Her desire to care for Jesus becomes distraction when all of a sudden she takes her eyes off of what she's doing to honor and worship Christ and she's looking at Mary. Maybe she was blinded by how unfair it seemed that Mary could just sit there while she had to do all of this work. Maybe they had an agreement that they were going to do this together and now Mary's broken her agreement. We're not exactly sure. But what we do know is that Martha stopped appreciating being able to care for Jesus. Her good intentions became something that took her away from the good. Then we look at Mary. What do we see from Mary in this story? We see her sitting at Jesus' feet. Her entire body language says, I am here with you. My intentions are to listen to you, to glean wisdom from you, to just sit in your presence, because I know that that is my main priority. Her heart is resolute. There is no question of what her intentions are or what her desires are. And so we can often do a team Mary in this situation. For sure, she has chosen the good portion. And Jesus even says this. She is honored and exalted when Martha publicly embarrasses her sir, in front of everybody who is listening. Jesus exalts her and says, no, no, this is what is good and right, is to sit and be still with me. So then we move into John chapter 11, verses 1 through 32. And a recap of this situation this is where Mary and Martha send word to Jesus because their brother is on his deathbed. He's about to die. And remember, Jesus has a beautiful relationship with them. He cares for them. And so they send word to him to let him know that his beloved friend is very sick and needs him to come. But Jesus doesn't come right away, which can be really confusing because you would think, wow, this amazing friend is dying, and these sisters who he loves are asking him to come and be with them, if not for his miraculous powers of healing, maybe just to comfort them as a friend. But Jesus decides to stay for two days beyond the Jordan. By the time Jesus is coming to them, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. That is the day that it took the messenger to travel to Jesus, the two days that he stayed in place, and the one day that it took to travel back. That would be so confusing as Mary and Martha. Where was he? What was he doing? His disciples were clued in, and we get clued in, that Jesus was doing it for their benefit, that they would believe. If Lazarus had been sick, and Jesus healed him as a sick man, 
It'd be like, wow, cool, yeah, we've seen that before. But as a dead man, wow, does that show the power Christ has over death. And so he stayed. Now, when they hear that Jesus is close to town, he's on his way, he's just at the edge of the city, Mary chooses to stay and weep and continue mourning. Martha, she jumps up and she runs to meet Jesus. When she gets there, in her scriptures, what it says, she wastes no time in letting him know, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And yet even now, if you ask, it will be done. She knew exactly who Christ was. She knew exactly who she was talking to. She was bold and honest. She was not afraid to bring to him her feelings, her struggles, her confusion, her questions. It can be so challenging to do that. I've been struggling with that now. With COVID, like, Lord, what are you doing? I'm a newly blended family. How are you having us stuck in the house all together, all the time? How is this your good? We need a break. <laughs> I'm sure that you guys can think of situations as well where you've come to Jesus like, where were you? Or where are you? I'm scared. I feel alone. I'm hurting. I'm suffering. Why aren't you coming sooner? And Martha shows us that we can have the boldness, the courage and honesty to come to Jesus and just lay it all out there. She's not ashamed, but she trusts her relationship with Christ is strong enough to handle her doubts. She remains standing before him in the confidence of their relationship. And Jesus has this beautiful conversation with her about the fact that he's the resurrection and that whoever dies and yet believes in him does not actually die. And he asks Martha flat out, do you believe this? And her answer parallels Peter, where she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. She is a woman of faith. She has strong faith that is not shaken by situations and circumstances. She's strong in her beliefs. She's been listening. Even in that last story when she's busy working, she has one ear listening to Jesus as she's doing her work to serve. And what do we see with Mary? Well, Mary comes when Martha calls her and says, Come, Jesus is here. He wants to talk to you. And I wonder, did she hesitate because of the depth of her grief at the loss of her brother? Did she hesitate because she wasn't sure how she was going to come to her friend with this confusion of, you know, why, why would you wait? What's with the lack of urgency? for your concern for us. Why didn't you come right away? Why did this not impact you as much as I thought it would? But when she sent for, she comes. And we again see Mary at Jesus' feet. That's the first place that she goes to. And she also says, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus is so moved that he weeps with her. And I love this because it shows Christ as a God of empathy. He sees these women suffering, coming to him in their own way and saying, Lord, we profess this truth about you. Had you been here, he would be alive. So in this situation, I think I've got to give a, a team Martha. I love her boldness. I love that she doesn't hesitate and wait until Christ calls for her, but she goes. She says, Lord, I have questions and <laughs> I need to talk to you. Whereas Mary hangs back and waits. We're not exactly sure the reason why, but I love the example that Martha sets for us of just boldly coming with our questions, our doubts, our confusions. And in the last section that we're going to look at today is John 12, verses 1 through 8. There's not 
many verses here, but it is such a beautiful section for these women. We are six days in this, era, in this section before Passover, days before Christ is to go to the cross. And he comes again through Bethany on his way to Jerusalem. I think after reading and studying, he came to them for comfort. He came to them because he is friends with them. And what do we do in a time of trial and challenge? We go to where there's comfort, where we know we will be built up, encouraged, and filled up with truth about who we are. This, I think, is exactly why Jesus goes to Mary and Martha. And he has dinner or lunch or a meal with them because we are told that Lazarus is reclining at the table with him. That would have been a pretty stunning thing to walk in on, is <laughs> this man who was previously dead, now having lunch with this man who's being pursued, death threats again made towards him, that he has to leave cities on his way back into town knowing what he's walking into. In verse 1, we see that it says that Martha is serving. There's no discussion of complaining, calling out, none of that. She is serving. And that's all it says. It seems to me that Martha is at peace in her role. She is embracing what she's called to do, irregardless of what anybody else is called to do. She's focusing on how she was uniquely made to serve Christ. What is the way that she can worship Jesus? And she's in, all in, all in on her gifting. In this situation, we see Mary come and pour oil all over Jesus' feet during this meal. It is thought that this oil was worth a year's salary. That is a lot. <laughs> But she wastes no time in honoring Christ with this. Not only does she pour the oil over his feet, we again see her at his feet with her hair, wiping the oil and spreading it on his feet. Now, women typically would have their hair pulled back and contained. So this probably means that she took it out intentionally to use it to wipe him as well as a servant attitude, a tender heart, a heart of submission. We again see her for the third time in this position at Jesus' feet, learning, confessing, and now honoring and worshiping. I think it's beautiful and amazing. And again, we see her accused in this action. Judas is saying how wasteful she's been with this oil and how we should have given it to God and, or given it to the poor. It sounds so holy, what Judas is saying. And yet Jesus, again, as Mary quietly waits for him to defend her, he comes to her defense and says, No, she is honoring me. This is beautiful. You'll have the poor with you always but I'm only with you for a short time. It's just incredible to me. Now, in these stories, when we see these women misstep, when we see Martha come and attack Mary for just sitting there, being at Jesus' feet, when we see Mary hold back from running to Christ, we see that these women are inward focused. They're looking at how unfair it is or the struggles and suffering that they're going through. But when they have eyes to see and ears to hear, they are able to embrace and thrive in the unique ways that God has designed them. We tend to divide these sisters. We tend to say, are you team, who am I? Team Ma Martha or are you team Mary? We put an or between them. I don't think that that's what God has for these precious women. I don't think that's what he has for us. I think he intends for us to have an and. There's no condemnation. He's not looking at these two women in the Bible and calling us to go, well, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? I don't think so. I think he intends for us to see these two imperfect women as an and, bringing them 
as incomplete pictures one on top of the other. And when we do that, we see a picture of Jesus. We see Jesus in Mary's responsiveness, her thoughtfulness, her submission, her tenderheartedness, her relational aspects, her empathy, her emotions and how she feels. We see Jesus in Martha's boldness, her call to responsibility, her confidence, her passion, her servant heart. She's a caretaker and she's practical. She cares about the worldly things, which Jesus tells us flat out to cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. When we stop putting an or between these sisters and start putting an and, we see a beautiful picture of Christ. We're not called to emulate a person. We're not called to be Mary or Martha. We're called to look more and more like Christ. I think that is why he has put these sisters in the Bible. Jesus did not just go away and hide himself to be with the Father. He didn't just spend his time in the temple, but he was out with the people. But he didn't drive himself to empty in serving. When he needed space, he got in a boat and he got, went to the other side of the sea. He took time with three close disciples to go and pray. He knew his balance. He knew his boundaries between those things. So ladies, let's stop with the or. Let's stop trying to be someone other than who we were uniquely created to be. Because the way we were created to be serves Jesus in a unique way. If you were created to serve, then serve joyfully because we need you. If you were created with incredible empathy, then go and walk alongside people in their joys and their sorrows because we need you. If you were called to be a stay-at-home mom, then do that with everything you have because we need that in this world. And if you were called to be a full-time working mom, do that because that is incredibly important and we need you in this world. Ladies, our world needs Mary and Martha because our world needs Jesus. Let's put off looking to the left and to the right to see what everybody else is doing. You have a unique way that you were created to worship Jesus and that brings something unique and special to the world to tell them who he is. We need you to live in the full creation of who you were meant to be.